basically just the, the difference between an armolo and the underwriter, right? Mm-hmm. So the armolo is actually originating that loan for you on your behalf as a lender. The underwriter is just making sure that the buyer has the ability to repay. Hey everyone, Dave Putz here from JKP Holdings. Alongside me, Mr. Nathan Turner. We apologize for a little delay, everyone. A little technical stuff going on here. I'm glad we connect for a few minutes. Um, before we get started with all this stuff, we wanted to do some quick housekeeping. Um, as you probably may know, I'm Dave Putz from JKP Holdings. Nathan Turner from Ernest Investing. We have a big event coming up, Nathan. It's a big deal, man. Just a little <laughs> bit. All right. So for those who don't know, we've been in note investments to 2010, buying traditional bank loan stuff, some little bit of seller finance stuff, but we're seeing a big shift Mm -hmm. and seller financing is becoming the thing. And I, it's funny for me, I actually started doing seller financing. So now for me, it's kind of coming back full circle where now I'm buying seller finance notes, which is what I was trying to do in the beginning, I was creating these notes and trying to sell them. Now I'm the, on the other side and I'm, I'm trying to buy the ones that people are creating, which is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So it's, it's really cool to, to have this kind of go first full circle. And for those who are saying, why would you want to do that? What is the advantage of it? For us, we can't buy 3% paper. And for those who have been out there, we I put a poll we put a poll out yesterday about what do you bid on based on UPB or whatnot, and a lot of people didn't realize interest is a huge factor in what we bid on. Yeah, um, and we'll be talking about the DME right how to bid, and what we're finding out is people don't realize it, but with seller finance the interest rate is very attractive. Yes, yeah, the higher the higher you can set that, the easier it is for you to sell it, the easier it is for me to buy it. We can do a lot of business, but you got to yeah. you got to write it properly. Yes, uh, and you can write it in a way that makes it more attractive for sale later. Yeah, and when we're buying these papers, and people say, well, "Why do you care?" Well, when we go to foreclose, we don't want a problem with a borrower. We don't want you to have a problem with the borrower. We want to cash people out. And for those who are note buyers, understand the fact that you're buying 10, 11, 12 percent paper at times. And not five and six percent interest. So when you're going to buy, you're going to get a much better, easier return, and your actual discount is a lot less, which yeah. is really attractive. Yeah. So all these things and more, we're going to be talking about all this stuff. Today is the last day, people, to save money on your DME ticket. I know a lot of people have bought already, and that's fantastic. Good. I'm glad. If you want to pay more, I'm actually fine with that. I'm just, I'm trying to help you out. Help me help you yeah. save some money. <laughs> Today is the last day to get uh, $200 off on your ticket. And it's also the last day to save money on that hotel block. So make sure you get that in today. If you bought your ticket, but not your hotel yet, get the hotel. Cause today's the last day for that, uh, that cheaper rate. And if you're curious what it's about, DME has traditionally been a note investing conference for note investors to learn and gain. It's not going to be that way this year. Nathan's running an awesome multifaceted notes investing note origination market conference where people from both sides of the table, per se, is going to be in attendance and be talking to each other. So those who are originating notes and want to get cashed out, guess what? We're going to be right there with you with checkbook rate rate, a deal for you. Yeah. And those are note buyers. You'll be sitting next to people out there who have loans, who want to sell them and want to get cashed out and willing to sell at a really awesome discount. Yeah, we can. Here's the cool thing. I was just having, I had a conversation with the guy yesterday where he says, okay, so if I'm going to create a note, if I create it with these terms, then you would buy that. And I said, absolutely. All day long. Yes. And he's like, oh, wow. You know, stars in his eyes, dollar signs. Yes, 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 yes. We can do a ton of business together. And so we're, we're here to help each other. I can't wait to meet a whole bunch of these seller finance yeah. people that are creating notes. And for those of note buyers are saying, we had a couple reach out saying, Dave, your webinar this week is really not for us. Well, we're going to tell you it's totally is for you. 
right? If you are going to buy a seller finance note, it's not the traditional um, due diligence process, right? There's another step to it. Because if you're buying paper that's not originated correctly, you're in deep water. Why is that? The borrower can sue you. We're going to go through the legal processes next uh, next webinar on the 26th with an attorney, right? But when you're creating that paper, if it's not originated correctly for owner finance property, you can get sued. Mm -hmm. Sure, none of us want to get sued, right? And there's fines, there's levies, and all that stuff. We'll talk about legally next time. We're talk today talking about what that process is to originate correctly. For Sano buyers, you got to make sure that collateral file has the ARMA logo and as well as the underwriting there to prove the fact that borrower has the right has the ability to repay. And we're going to cover a lot of that today. But a yeah. DME is all going to be having that same conversation in live, in person in Nashville. Yeah. So get your tickets. Hey. Last day, last day. Go and get them. Diver Diversifiedmortgageexpo.com. Cool. So we're going to Price bring in tomorrow. a special guest now. So we have a special guest that's going to be coming on today. Uh, before we bring Sarah on, we understand the fact that RMLO is very confusing for both note buyers and originators. And a lot of people out there are originating and underwriting without both sides. They're doing what we call a checkbook underwriting, meaning you have a checkbook, you're underwritten, and you get the loan. That <laughs> doesn't work, right? So when we work with people like this, we want to make sure that we help them. We're not experts, right? We're going to help you along that process so we can buy them. We have an alternative motive here, right? We want to cash you out, refi, and let you go buy more and originate more loans. Yeah. Right? So when we come to DME, be present, be ready. And if you haven't bought your tickets already, make sure uh, check out the DME. Uh, if you need a link, whatever, put in the comments um, and whatnot. So we already got some comments coming in. So we're going to bring on Sarah. Let me uh, flip the screen. Oh, awesome. So... We have Sarah on today. She is an Armolo expert out of Texas. Sarah, could you explain Hello. first? How'd you get in the space? How'd you learn about all this stuff? And the, just the background of who you are. Sure. Um, Sarah Montes, Texas Pride Lending. Um, so yes, we. I started with um, with the gurus of the gurus of owner finance. Um, I started. Um, working with two gentlemen that have been doing it for like 20 years. And all I did was just sit there in their office and listen, 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 and just soaked up <laughs> I just soaked out all the information that I could, especially when someone's been in the business for so long, you, um, you hear and you see, you know, the historical side of owner finance. And um, whenever Dodd-Frank uh, rules and regulations came about, everybody started freaking out. Oh my gosh, you know, we can't do seller finance anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you learn that mm -hmm. the history of all of, of real estate investing is that you always uh, try to figure out how you're going to continue going, uh, abiding by the rules and regulations. All these new compliance laws come out all the time. It's just keeping up with them and, and, and uh, making them a part of your business. So that's what we did. That's why they brought me in because I was a licensed loan officer and they said, hey, you know, would you be interested in in originating owner finance books for us? Mm -hmm. Because now we have to do it. <laughs> now it's yeah. required. So uh, so I, I came in and learned the business um, as far as the, the owner uh, finance side. So um, we pretty much developed the RMLO you know, package or the RMLO, you know, what's going to what's going to satisfy this new law. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with Grant Camp long time ago, he was, um, you know, just very active on, um, social media, doing a lot of webinars, teaching people how to do this. Um, very young, very young guy. He, um, he, he also was one of my mentors, but I mean, he had 60 homes within, you know, one year. Um, and it was all, you know, sub twos and creative financing and wraps. And so it's not just owner finance, right? It's all the other stuff that makes it so interesting is, um, the creative financing behind it all. Mm -hmm. Um, so that intrigued me a lot. So uh, that's why I was really focused and really determined to learn all of it, every bit and piece. Um, so that's how Texas pride got created, uh, was solely for real estate investors that were creating owner finance notes. And so this what, was, you know, a good 15 years ago, <laughs> 10 yeah, years ago. What year, so uh, we, um, 
What year did you get started with uh, that? We started in 2000, yeah, 2013, because the law yeah. went into effect in 2010. But yeah. it, it, they created it in 2010, but it didn't go into effect in 2013. So that's when we started. Yeah. And I forgot to add in the housekeeping, yes, this is recorded. This will be on YouTube, our podcast, um, on our website. We can actually have it. So on, my, on JKP Holdings slash webinars, you'll see a recording on there as well. All this will be recorded and available for the podcast or webinar. So yes. So no, let's go so back. Interesting. Just one real quick. Yeah. So I had learned about Dodd-Frank. I was doing all these seller finance deals and putting, you know, in Columbus, Ohio, is a bunch of land contracts. And, uh, and I'd learned about this Dodd-Frank thing and I'd heard about it and I knew it was going to be implemented in 2013. <clears throat> so we started looking around, me and my old partner, we started looking around for an RMLO. We knew that's what we needed. We knew that that was what, what was required. We could not find anybody, nobody. It was uh, like, just, they just did not exist. Knowing that that was the rule and knowing that we couldn't find anybody, we had to, we had to shut it down. There was no way that we could continue doing it properly and legally. So we, we abandoned that model, which was really too bad. It, it was a great model, but we knew that we couldn't do it right. So I'm so glad uh, it took a couple of years for me to find people like you yeah. that you had to underwrite and how to how to write them properly so that they're done legally. So we have to understand that Dodd Frank Law came out of the debacle, right? It yeah. really came out of the problems that were happening back in 05, 06, 07, 08. And the I understand the fact that borrowers were really getting in bad shape because of poor underwriting and whatnot. So new rules came out for that reason to protect the borrowers. So this mm -hmm. entire world is around protecting the borrowers and doing it legitimately. Now understand if you are going to try bypassing this stuff and get away with it, we feel that they're going to actually make the rules even stricter if it continues to be violated because they want to protect all the people, right? So those who are listening on LinkedIn and Facebook, understand that, yes, could you get away with it? I'm sure you could. We're not looking to get away with anything. We want to be right to the borrowers and we want to do good business. Right. And if you're doing a That's lot right. of these notes and creating them, do legitimately right. Yeah. Now, you may lose some borrowers because they don't qualify, but they shouldn't qualify then. Right. We're not just screwing people over here. So we want to make sure we're clear that this law came out to protect borrowers to do it right. Absolutely. So, yep. so. And if you're going to act as a lender, then you have to follow all the all the laws that lender that typical lenders do as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, granted, the underwriting guidelines are going to be way different. But <laughs> but you still have to follow the, the general rules and general laws. Yeah. So when we talk about this stuff, you know, there's a lot to do with this idea of RMLO with underwriting and whatnot. Uh, and then Sarah put a great PowerPoint together with us. Um, inside of our, 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 our links, there's actually a link. If you want to get Sarah's information, click on the, the pin post and that will give you a webinar link. Just fill out the form and you'll get an automatic email with Sarah's information. So to get that, that'd be great. With that said, um, when we work on stuff like this, we hear a lot about this RMLO and its underwriting and loan originations and loan. These are really words that for note buyers, we never really dealt with or heard about. And for what we're finding out, me and Nathan, a lot of originators haven't heard about it either. So can you, before we get to the PowerPoint, can you kind of break down what an RMLO is and what an underwriter is. I know we got some bunch of questions initially we're gonna ask and then we'll open up for Q&A, but what is an RMLO? What is an underwriter? What's the difference between the two? Sure. So the, the RMLO is originating the loan. Uh, so we are, we are the loan officer that's going to originate for you. Uh, I guess more importantly, the RMLO is the mortgage company or the mortgage broker that is going to originate that, that loan for you. Uh, to keep you compliant because Dodd-Frank does have a licensing requirement. So as an investor, real estate investor, you're not licensed to do loans. That's why you hire your RMLO slash loan broker mm -hmm. to originate that loan on your behalf to satisfy the licensing requirement. So that's why you use the RMLO piece of it. Um, an underwriter is just uh, looking at someone's income and their debt, to, their debt to income ratios and figuring out whether or not that they have the ability to repay. 
So the other thing with Dodd-Frank, one of the rules for Dodd-Frank is ability to repay. So yeah. you do need the underwriter to uh, review, to process the loan and say, yes, this person does have the ability to repay this loan. Um, so that's the second part of it. Um, with us, obviously, we do we do all everything. We do the Armlow side. We do the underwriting side. We provide you with a full, complete underwriting package. Um, one of the other rules on Dodd-Frank is to also disclose the loan terms to the buyer. Um, so that is very important as well. So the buyer knows what, what kind of loan they're getting themselves into, right? It's yep, all in black and white and it's in writing. Mm -hmm. And so that's another piece of, of, of the, the RMLO process. Um, so, you know, everybody just hears the word RMLO. They really don't know what it is. And it does stand for Real Estate Mortgage Loan Originator, um, which is across the board for anybody that's originating loans, you know, whether it's a bank or a mortgage company or, or anything. So um for us in specific to what we're talking about is we're originating those private notes owner finance notes um so to keep you compliant since you're not in the business you're not licensed this is why we come in is to help yeah. out with to just make sure that you're creating qualified mortgages and the reason to go and i mean the reason to do a qualified mortgage right is to get more bank yeah. to get more uh, more dollars for your uh, for your notes that's yeah, but also you know, it's a fact to make it? sure if you go to foreclosure that you're not going to have a problem and your borrower is not going to fight it, right? The so borrower right. can argue that 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 <laughs> loan was created incorrectly or illegally. Yeah, and we won't get the legal side of it. Just the fact that understand you can be sued by a borrower if you're not licensing, you're creating these things, or if you don't underwrite correctly. Yes. So there's going to be several reasons. Um, so if you don't do, if you say, no, you know what, I'm just, or my, you know, there's a lot of attorneys, a lot of tile companies out there that are saying uh, you don't, you know, you can go ahead and, and continue doing seller finance the way you wish uh, because it's a, you know, they don't understand that um, uh, the, that what, what's happening with Dodd-Frank is that they're protecting the consumer. So if the, the buyer is purchasing a home as their homestead, that's where it becomes, you know, that it falls under the Dodd-Frank rules and regulations. So a lot of people don't know that. Um, and so if they're going to buy that, that property as their homestead, they're a protected class. And um, so that's why you have to go through all the different um, qualifications for a qualified mortgage is, uh, number one, you know, points and fees. You can't charge excessive fees. You get a max of 3%. Uh, your loan terms um, can't have a negative amortization. They got to be under 30 years or less. Um, you know, no balloons. You know, we'll talk more about balloons if you guys <laughs> when yeah, we get to that point. But, it, yeah. Um, yeah. but you can't do risky features. That's the most important thing. You don't want you your your you want to create a qualified mortgage, uh, a mortgage that someone is going to actually be able to pay. Um, that's not going to default. Um, you don't want to put risky features in that note um, to set them up for failure. Right. Understand we're talking about owner occupied homes, investor yeah. homes don't apply here, commercial and whatnot. These are strictly for borrowers who are occupying the home you're creating the note for. So if you're doing wraps, right, and you create a note for a borrower who's a live in the home, you must be underwriting, you must be using RMLO. If you can do or three or less, you can do your own. We encourage you to underwrite still with the licensed person who can do the underwriting part, but you need to understand that if you're doing this in a business, you should be doing this. So we have some quick questions. I know Nathan I sent over to you as well. Um, where are you licensed at? Yeah, exactly. Uh, where are you currently <laughs> licensed to do RMLO work? Um, so right now it's Texas and Arkansas. Uh, we're definitely going to go into other states, Florida, Oklahoma, um, Colorado. So we have, we already have, you know, several that we're going to uh, put on our list to get started with that. Um, I know, you know, we've obviously, we've, we've been here for a long time. We've done this for over 10 years um, and we get the calls all the time. You know, I wish you were licensed over here. I wish you were. <laughs> and we just, we just got so busy in Texas that it was impossible for us to take on other states. Um, but now we are to that growth level where we can say, okay, now it's time and now we can go expand into a different states and start helping uh, owner finance investors um, in different states. So definitely reach out to us and let us know what state you want us to get licensed in and we'll get yeah. that process started. 
That's awesome. But in the meantime, though, what we can do, we also offer an out-of-state pack underwriting package. So we can still underwrite that file for you. Um, so that if you're going to create this, uh, this note um, and you want to make sure that your, buyer, your buyers are meeting at least, you know, the, the, the five points of, of the qualified mortgage, um, we can definitely do that for you. We can still provide you with a complete underwriting package um, for you to have in your, you know, in your files. Um, if you do have to go to foreclosure or anything like that, at least you did that part, right? Yeah. And that's a little bit of a protection okay. there for you. I've got one other question just on on terms and licenses and, and uh, titles, I guess. Another one that we've heard is processor. Is that the same as an underwriter or is that something different than an underwriter? Yeah, so um, a processor <clears throat> is just really just an admin putting together the information. Um, an underwriter needs to be licensed. Got it. Also. So, yeah. So the difference is Armalo underwriters have to be licensed. Uh, a loan processor should be, by law, should be uh, licensed as well if they're, if they're touching, you know, a, a mortgage loan. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So you can have a processor. Let's just say you're a real estate investor and you want to have a processor. You want to hire your own person to do it. You mm -hmm. can. But you have to have a mortgage company or you have to be licensed. Your company has to be licensed. And then you can hire a processor and underwriter to work under you. But the first step is to be licensed. Okay. Yeah, we all hear all these different terms and I'm like, okay, is that what this yeah. does? You know, it's yeah. very confusing and very overwhelming for even us note buyers. Those who are creating these notes who are following these courses of doing subject twos and wraps, I'm sure it's even more confusing because they just want to do real estate, right? Yeah. So it's <laughs> It's, it's yeah, and then so you know that's the other thing. That's the other thing that I always tell you know when the when uh, we actually got a, a recent rap law um, passed here in Texas that that just added more um, you know obstacles to do raps, um, and it's just a Texas law here. But um, so when that happened, everybody said, you know what, this is it. I'm getting licensed. Okay. So they, so what happens is they start researching and they're like, wait a minute, it doesn't matter if I get licensed, I still can't do this. I mean, this is a lot of stuff to know and I don't know all the laws and regulations and you know, the 900 pages of Dodd-Frank. Yeah. <laughs> so they, some of them still got licensed but they still use Texas Pride to underwrite and process and do the, do the, the you know, the back backend uh, office work of, of the origination. Good, awesome. Okay. All right, just so clarification. let's dive into, I know that there's some comments going through about an independent loan processes required to be licensed in most states from SoHow. Um, and it is in some uh, select states, the independent underwriter is required to be licensed. I'm presuming that's similar kind of thing. Thank you, SoHow, for chiming in there. Um, that's awesome. Um, so I'm glad those are joining in here. Feel free to ask questions. Uh, Nathan, did you get a chance to review some of the questions we got? Yeah, I'm wondering if we do we do the questions or should we get into yeah, let's do the, the, let's do the Now, I got a PDF from you. I'm presuming we're going to run through the PDF. Is that the is that the best way to do it, Sarah? Or you have this in PowerPoint as sure. well? Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I guess I could have done the, the PowerPoint. Okay. The PowerPoint. But uh, go ahead. Just do the, okay. the, the slides. That's fine. All right. <clears throat> all right so right here on this first slide i said safer because the one of the the acts is called the safe act yeah <laughs> so just if anybody's wondering why safe what <laughs> so it relates to the safe act <laughs> got it got it so what we're talking about here is you know seller finance stuff and the idea of what is qualified to be a qualified mortgage and that's really protecting the borrower or stuff so I'm glad we can discuss that 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 feature of it um, to make sure people understand what that means and go from there. And again, as note buyers, <clears throat> this is a huge plus, huge, huge, huge. Uh, yep. Maybe even a deal breaker. So yes, yes. So if you're looking to get out of your loan for whatever reason, I highly encourage you to kind of stay compliant. So yep. As you can see, a lot of information, she's been doing it for a long time. Um, Texas Prize has been in Texas for a long time doing all this stuff. And most loans that are being originated are in Texas. So Texas is the reason we're really focused on Texas RMLOs at this time. I know Ellis asked about RMLO in California. Um, I have been in touch with some people who can do RMLOs in other states. 
So feel free to come out and talk about this. So we went over a little bit about this, Sarah. I'll let you kind of chime in here. Can you explain sure. a little bit more about this process? Sure, yes. Um, so um, a lot of, you know, the, the big question is why use an armalo? Uh, so it's been a law since 2013. So again, you know, it's, it's not a law that just happened yesterday. Everybody needs to get educated. If you're going to be doing this as a business, you need to stay compliant as a lender. Um, so that's very important just to do good business. Um, you're going to be, you know, in the real estate game, you're going to uh, start selling notes. You want to get top dollar for those notes. So, I mean, if you're not going to do it right, why do it at all, right? Yep. So um, that's number one. Um, and then, so secondly, the foreclosure protection, right? So if you, um, and we're going to call them the end buyer. So the end buyer um, is purchasing a house and, you know, within four to six months, they um, stop paying. You need to to go to foreclosure court, that um, that uh, judge is going to say, well, did you originate this correctly? Um, are you licensed? Did you make sure they had the ability to repay back this loan? They're going to ask you all these questions. And if you don't use an RMLO, you're not going to have the proof that you did all the things that you were supposed to. Um, so if that were to happen, um, you know, so what, what, what an armola does is protect you from that foreclosure, um, that foreclosure court. When you get in there, you can say, here you go. I have an underwriting package. I have this, I have that. I have all my ducks in a row. I'm super organized. I am doing business correctly. And then they'll grant you the foreclosure without any issues. Awesome. Um, so I don't know if we want to go into the the ramifications on uh, on that, but maybe here in a we minute. Can, yeah, we're going to have two um, attorneys. So those who are coming on the 26th, we'll be doing a follow-up on the legal part of it, like what happens if you don't do these things. So let's focus on what the proper origination is, but we feel free to kind of divvy if you feel needed to switch over. Awesome. So let me scroll down um, and let you yeah. guys... Let's go to why the the whole Dodd Frank Protection Act uh, yeah. got started. Um, you know the too big to fail situation in 2008 uh -oh. financial crisis. Mm -hmm. um, they were giving loans to anybody that had a heartbeat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> anybody that had a pulse, they were giving loans to. So yeah. that you know it 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 crashed our uh, our you know our financial system and um, and so they don't want that to happen again. And so how do they fix that? Is just to regulate any lender. It doesn't matter if you're a bank or a broker or or you know a seller finance person that's loaning money. Um, uh, I do and just to to add to that, um, I don't only just work with seller finance uh, investors. I also work with a lot of people that are offering private financing. Um, so a lot of uh, investors are creating um, kind of like a loan fund or a hedge fund, and they are just loaning money to anybody that wants to go buy a house, you know, and so um, you're acting as a bank. So if you're doing that, you know, this is this is where you need to uh, make sure that you're following these rules. But so yes, a real quick question they ask about, is it, does this affect any kind of uh, land notes as well? Does land play a role at all in this? Okay, so that's a great question. I get that all the time. Um, so vacant land or vacant lots, um, if that person is going to utilize that, that vacant lot um, as their homestead residence within the first five years of that note, then yes, you have to follow these rules and regulations because, okay, so this is what happens. You sell a lot. You're like, oh, you know, I can sell it however. I don't have to go through an arm low. Mm -hmm. um, and then in two years, they build a house or they move a permanent mobile home there. Um, and now it's their homestead and now, and, and then you have to foreclose. Well, guess what? <laughs> yeah. They're going to say, wait a minute, this is their right. homestead. Why didn't you originate it correctly? So just to protect you again, you know, number one and number two. So if you do create a qualified mortgage on that uh, vacant lot, um, a lot of people are selling those, so those notes, right? They're, they're, they're splitting up they're, They'll go buy a hundred acres, sure. split it all up and then sell those notes and, um, and do it all over again. Yeah. Awesome. So, we're so really when you're, and about, let me just add on that. Yeah, go ahead. So I'm going to add that when you're selling notes, um, you know, when you go to a note buyer, what do you say? Oh, I have this piece of land over here, and yeah, you know, what do you what do you give them? What do you give them? Just a, a three, you know, three paper uh, document with a promissory note. Um, so with our package, you can actually give them a hundred, a stack of a hundred, you know, a hundred page uh, package that makes you look organized, legit, and makes you look like somebody I want to do business with, right? Yeah. Like your no buyer is going to be impressed. 
yeah. and your note buyer is going to say, bring me more. I want to do business yeah. with you. Uh, but if you bring them a three page promissory note, they're like, what is this? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Two weeks ago, I got one that I got, I had two notes. They were one page each. And I'm like, oh my gosh, come on. <laughs> that's not going to fly. <clears throat> and there's a lot of things that go into these notes. We were talking about in a previous webinar, the fact that you must include certain things in this note, right? The first, when the date of the first payment, the interest rate, your, your monthly payment should be separated with your p &I, with your monthly principal and interest payment, separate from the escrow amount that has to be separated. And you have to make sure inside the escrow that you're saying to the borrower, it was subject to change. You, we've seen too many papers recently where they merged the PITI, principal interest tax and insurance, yeah. into one payment, and they don't put anything about the fact that the escrow will change or adjust over years if interest goes up, so then it gets stuck in a balloon. And we could talk more about that if you want to reach out. What that means, it, it's just dangerous to do. So you need to write that note, clear cut, the start date, how many, what's the term, what's the p &I, what's the escrow, what's the full monthly payment, what's the expectations, and everything, interest rate everything in there to make sure the borrower is well aware of what's going on even an amortization schedule is is um yeah. it's almost mandatory too so yeah. that the buyer really understands you know the amortization of the loan yeah yeah you gotta have your truth and lending stuff in there like it's a one page two page three page that it's i guarantee you don't have everything in there that you need to have yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's not just the Dodd-Frank uh, rules. It's also the RESPA rules, the truth and lending rules. There's a lot of laws that you have to abide by. And so, you know, definitely seek professional help, third party, to do that kind of stuff, to lead you in the right direction, make sure that you're writing good paper. So Cindy's got a good question. Let's say um, you say, well, I use my attorney to, to draw everything up. <clears throat> is that good enough? Does that qualify? If I just, if I have an attorney draw everything up, is that good? Well, okay. So your attorney's not going to have a loan system that's going to give a loan estimate with the APR. So then the, one of the other rules is that you have to disclose the A, the APOR to your buyer, mm -hmm. um, the annual percentage, uh, you know, rate on the, on the, so your attorney doesn't have a loan system that's going to spit that out for you. They're not going to, they're not going to have the qualified mortgage report that says, Hey, you, you actually created a qualified mortgage and here's the results um, and the proof. Um, and your attorney's not going to have, uh, I mean, he, all, I'm, I'm thinking all he can do, he can legally um, originate that loan for you. Yes, they are, they are legally to, able to do that, but yeah. all your, you're still just going to get your promise that you're a note and deed of trust. You're not going to get all the other um, required uh, loan disclosures that are required by law on any real estate transaction, right? Um, it's not just seller finance, but when you're doing a real estate transaction, you also have to include all the other um, RESPA disclosures. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if your attorney has those that, you know, um, it, you know, I've seen a lot of attorney um, packages uh, over the years. And sometimes I'm, I, you know, I'm just like, I, I can't believe that this closing package is, you know, seven pages. Yeah. Um, so just beware, be careful. If you are going to have your attorney originate that loan for you on your behalf, uh, make sure that they're checking all the boxes and that your buyer's getting all the disclosures that they're, that they're supposed to be getting. Yeah. So okay. just to make sure we're we're accurate, just A T O R stands for. Someone asked that question. Was A T O R stand for? The A P O R. So yeah, that's the annual percentage offer rate. So we'll get that. Well, there's another slide on that yep. um, here in a minute. So we um, let's see if we want to go down to that. Um, so, so yeah, I think we probably already talked key. about this. is key. We we went over this a little bit before. Okay. Any highlights you want to kind of cover on this before we go? The next slide. Um, yes. So really just the, the difference between an RMLO and the underwriter, right? Mm -hmm. So the RMLO is actually originating that loan for you on your behalf as a lender. The underwriter is just making sure that the buyer has the ability to repay. So I know that there's this big company out there that says call the underwriter. Mm -hmm. um, but all they're doing is just doing what you could probably do yourself and say, okay, these are your debt. This, this is the buyer's debt and this is their income and do the math, right? That's all pretty much what they're doing. They're going to just, um, you know, look at all the, um, uh, the proof of income that you're providing to them. Cause they don't, they don't go out and get that directly from the buyer. Um, and they're just doing pretty much the math for you and calculating it for you. I don't think that an underwriter suffice or call the underwriter, whatever they provide is not 
sufficient for uh, number one, the licensing requirement, and number two, um, you know, something that you could probably just do on your own um, if you're just really just trying to figure out whether they have the ability to repay or not. Okay. So it's a big difference. Yeah. So just you still I need a normal a lot of comments coming through. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I sent the message to Nathan. <laughs> so um, just to kind of feed anything, we're trying to feed everything in, and we do our best to answer all the questions. Um, but just understand that if you have additional questions, feel free to shoot us an email or click the form. It's in the uh, the box and we'll get through as much as we can today. Um, I know that one of the things we're focusing on here is the borrower, right? This is all about the borrower. Make sure they have the ability to repay. Make sure the rate's not too high. Make sure that it's a legitimate loan. And we're passing all the legal Dodd-Frank rulings and stuff like that. So um, and we have some really great people in the chat going back and forth. Um, I see Mark. I see uh, Sohal. Um, I, I see Nick on, of course. Uh, and we're going to get mo as much questions as we possibly can um, in the process of doing all this stuff. Um, so cool. Okay. Yeah, we can go to the next uh, slide and, yeah, and try to absolutely. So get I'm to, juggling get to the good stuff. Things, so. <laughs> All right. So ATR, before we get to, what does ATR stand for again, for those who may not know? Ability to repay. Ability to repay. Again, folks in the borrower. Cool. Thank you much. Okay. So, so Dodd-Frank does not set any kind of specific rule on the DTI, because I know that's a huge question for everybody. Well, what DTI are they supposed to be under? Uh, Net to so income, by the way, for those a... who don't know. Oh, sorry. And just the loan officer side. <laughs> and just the FYI, <laughs> the, the, um, the uh, yeah, APOR, correct. So uh, the if you made a mistake and you did this incorrectly, we're going to get to that. So bear with us. We may be a little longer than an hour. We're... We expected uh, an hour, hour and a half, but we're going to get to as much as we can. So go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. So just to just to touch on the DTI, um, you verify, consider the DTI that they're going to provide. Uh, we do pull credit just, and we don't look at credit uh, scores. All we're looking at is the liabilities. Um, and so we take their proof of income, we take their liabilities, and then we that's how we come up with the DTI. Um, so that's the debt to income ratios. So um, when we do that, you know, you get a percentage. And so we just like to stay under 48% DTI. Again, there's no set number. It's, it's uh, going to be each investor's, you know, whatever they choose to do and how to, uh, how to uh, set their underwriting guidelines for themselves and for their buyers. Um, but what I like to do is I just kind of go based off of what the, um, the guidelines are in, in, you know, for FHA or for Freddie Mac, you know, I just try to follow those. I think FHA went all the way up to 50% this past year. Um, so I'm not too familiar with the conventional, uh, the conventional financing, but I do like to stay up on, um, there, if there's any changes on DTI thresholds, um, so that we can kind of mirror those, those thresholds for you. Okay. So. I'm going to scroll down here. And um, again, just to, and so for the underwriting too, it's just really just makes sense underwriting. Um, you know, you just need to, to make sure that you're looking at everything. And um, we have a lot of people, a lot of our end buyers are cash buyers or self-employed buyers. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the questions that I get, you know, what if they get paid cash? Um, so you just really just have to do an analysis. Uh, we'll, we'll take six months of their bank statements and we'll uh, average out six months of, of whatever they're depositing every month. Um, right. And come up with that monthly pay, uh, monthly income for yeah. them. Yeah. So. Okay. And for those, you know, idea about the DTI, it's all about the borrower. So the lower, the better you are, because then you just have a better quality note um, in the eyes of the law. So yeah. So Al, absolutely. Um, Kevin Cordell also asked a question: Is that I made a comment, which is really key. The MLO is the only person allowed to pass to the consumer, right? They're, they're negotiating the loan per se, right? They're talking to the consumer there because if you do any kind of conversation with that borrower, you're not licensed to have that conversation. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. So that's why you hire the RMLO is to do those those negotiations with you or disclose those loan terms to the buyer and, and you know, kind of speak on your behalf, right? Of mm -hmm. what your interest rate uh, requirements are, down payment requirements, all of that. Yeah, awesome. Great. So, qualified mortgage, we have five points we're focused on. 
Yep. So the qualified mortgage, um, you know, pretty much your you can't go over your points and fees. Um, so that's going to be loan origination fees. Uh, not a lot of people charge loan origination fees, but some do. Uh, so you know, we just need to be careful to stay under the threshold of three percent, or else you're not going to have a qualified mortgage. Um, your loan terms must be 30 years or less, so you can't do a 40 <laughs> 40 year uh, amortized loan. Right. Um, uh, balloon payments, um, they don't want to see balloon payment terms. Uh, what I suggest in lieu of a balloon is uh, to do an adjustable rate mortgage. So do an arm. Um, you do have to have it fixed for five years. That's one of the rules. But after five years, if you do like a five-year arm, then you can um, ag aggressively um, increase that interest rate. So it, it um it you know helps them kind of get encouraged to refinance or pay off the loan. Hmm. That's another avenue instead of doing a balloon, you can do an arm. That's a good yeah. idea. Um, and then the no negative amortization really is just the no you know the, if you're going to try to do like an interest only type of loan, um, you're putting that that buyer kind of in a bad position um, at the end of the term. You know you don't you don't want them to be upside down on their on their on their loan and. So uh, no risky features on, on these loans that you're writing or these, these notes that you're writing. Okay. Um, and the APOR, uh, APOR, I guess, I'm sorry, average prime offer rate. So um, we also just let you know, whenever we get your, um, your transaction and we're gonna originate your transaction, we check what the, that week's APOR is, um, what the primary is, and we calculate that for you and we say, okay, whether you're good or maybe you're just a little bit over that threshold. Um, so we just make sure that you're under it uh, to, in order for you to have a qualified mortgage. So um, that would be prime rate plus six and a half percent. Yeah. So if today's prime rate is 7.25, then you're going to add the six and a half percent to that. And that's your max interest rate that you can charge that, that end buyer. So, you know, I always thought that that, that was a sense. state specific thing, but that's a national, that's a national qualification. This is national. Right, 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 right. National. So the state specific uh, interest rate thresholds, those are um, when you're getting into like the 20%, the, the you know, interest rates, uh, when you're going way, way above um, the these thresholds here. So it's not, um, I don't think that you can really compare the same thing because we, um, as professionals or, or, you know, originators, we're not going to let you get to that usury rate. Right. Okay. Interesting. So, so what's this so high that price being versus said, high cost? So that being said, the higher price versus the high cost, this is where, uh, today, if you go six and a half plus prime, you're, you're going to be considered a higher priced, uh, mortgage. If you, say, Sarah, you know what? I don't care that I'm over that. I don't care that I have a qualified mortgage. I still want to write this note. I want to go as a non-QM. Okay, we can still do that. But now you're going over onto the high cost mortgage. So if you go over that interest rate threshold of six and a half plus prime, then you're going to be considered a high cost mortgage and um, you can still do it and you're still okay. You're not breaking any laws. There's only, there's just a, a other um, small items that you need to do. The buyer has to take like a home buyer's class uh, a first-time home buyer's class with a certificate mm -hmm. and everything. Um, you have to get two appraisals on the property, um, extra disclosures, things like that. So you can still do it. You just have to have your buyer go through a little bit more of a um, uh, the qualification, clarify, qualification process. Okay. When, what if this is a land contract? I know Texas doesn't do land contracts, but from our understanding, it doesn't matter what the type of instrument is for the, the connection. It's the fact that the note itself, it doesn't mortgage, land contracts, CFDs, all come in the same bucket that if you're creating a note backed by some kind of security instrument, this needs to be in place, correct? Correct, because it's all about the origination of that mortgage note. Yeah. So if you can just think about that, it's the origination piece of it. What about a, what a, what about a lease with an option to purchase sometime in the future? Is that the loophole? So... Yeah, I think every state has their own uh, laws on that. Uh, Texas has six months, so you can only do a lease to own for six months. After that, you have to transfer the the deed. So, yeah. uh, or you have to actually do the actual closing with them. Um, so, um, for people that are listening that are in Texas and don't know that, that's that's a big one. You need to make sure that if you're doing lease to own, that you're um, actually selling the property to them um, month six. Okay. 
Very good. Interesting. Um, so we already talked about the foreclosure court a little bit. Um, so uh, if you do have to foreclose on a property and you go to foreclosure court and you don't have uh, an RMLO um, involved or your package or your underwriting or ability to repay or anything that says that, hey, I did what I was supposed to do to uh, originate this loan, um, then you're going to be required. They're still going to uh, they're still going to give you the foreclosure, but you're going to have to pay back um, any interest that you've earned on that loan and any closing costs, attorney costs, court costs wow. uh, from the time That's of origination. Stiff. That's really stiff. This is getting scary, guys. For those who yeah. are originating loans and watch this <laughs> yeah. and you didn't do any of this stuff. This is your business. This is your livelihood. This is food on your table. Kind of yeah, stuff. it's just not worth it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, just getting a little bit, little bit, uh, you know, more serious there with the fees and fines, uh, yeah. the fines and fees. And, and but, we'll go into uh, that deeper. You know, I, we'll do it deeper with our yeah. attorney. We're going to have Jeff Watson come on next, uh, our next webinar on twenty six. For those who are tuning in, and that will be just before DME. So we're going to take a break to DME week because hopefully we'll see everyone there. Um, and folks on the fines before we get there. So those who are curious about it, make sure you learn about joining the 26 for that that session to talk about it. Yeah, get um, your legal questions together for that one. We'll yep. we'll pepper Jeff with that. Yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> okay, so this is a big one for for note buyers. Um, I get this all the time. I get note buyers calling me saying, "Hey, I got you know portfolio here. It wasn't originated correctly." what can we do? Yeah. <laughs> so um, the, <laughs> the easy answer is re-originate it. So um, mm. the the way to do that is to do a loan modification on each one of them or, you know, to do a loan modification on that loan. Um, mm. The only thing that you're, that you're required to do is give them a, um, a better term. So um, I would suggest, let's just say that note is five years, you know, five years old. Um, maybe you rewrite that loan as a 25-year uh, mortgage note reduce the interest rate just a slight, slight, slight bit. Um, and then, you know, there you go. Yeah. So yeah. if you create a land contract or CFD, if you're outside Texas, of course, and you are, are originating this incorrectly, just go back to the bar and say, listen, we're going to flip this over to a mortgage, right? We'll, we'll keep, we'll create a note, we'll create a mortgage and we'll get rid of the land contract. If you're in Texas, you create this, make a deal with the borrower and say, listen, we're going to make a deal. We, we're going to fix some stuff up. Things have changed a little bit. And we're going to drop your half percent. Let's recreate this thing and get you in a better spot. And that's how really to fix it is should and be done. Resign that and then you're good to go. Yeah. And then we get buying it. We're still buying it. So yeah. We're almost done. We'll get to the, some of the so, stupid questions as well. Sure. Yeah. So the underwriting package, just so you know, it just includes a statement of compliance. And it's just going to be, you know, really just the our, the loan officer saying, hey. We've, we've reviewed, we've verified, we feel like this buyer does have the ability to repay. You're good to go, you got a good loan. The qualified mortgage report is something that our loan system spits out. It's just gonna say check mark, check mark, check mark. Yes, you, you, you have a qualified mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, we do provide you with a credit report. Uh, again, we don't review it, we don't look at it, we don't uh, put it up as a part of, a, of our qualification process. Um, the only time that we'll come to you, we'll come back to you is if there's a red flag. Uh, foreclosure, uh, any kind of uh, federal laws, bankruptcies, you know, major things like that, then we'll say, hey, you know, Greg Fug, uh, you need to review this before we proceed or move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, the proof of income, whatever the buyer has provided, you know, all the supporting documents for the ability to repay. Um, and then the main thing is the loan disclosures. Um, so if we want to flip to the next one, we can kind of go to what we're going to be mm -hmm. providing them. Um, the number one thing is the, um, the loan estimate. Right, because again, um, Dodd Frank wants you to be super clear and transparent with your buyer um, that shows what the loan terms are in black and white in writing, and that they've acknowledged it. Right, so they, later on they can say, "Why do you know my interest rate was nine point five percent?" So here, so here we're just going to show really quick, you know, um, just the highlighted areas that um, we're showing them where uh, the loan term is, what type of product it is. Um, uh, one of the big things on here is going to be the monthly payment um, and that there's no balloon penalties, uh, prepayment penalties. Oh, we didn't even go over that one. So prepayment penalties is a big one, too. So a lot of investors think that they're allowed to charge their end buyer a prepayment penalty. Yeah. Um, but because they're used to being charged a prepayment penalty, yeah. a lot of hard money out there, you have prepayment penalties. So they say, well, 
well, my loan has a prepayment penalty. I need to pass that on to the, to the end buyer. But you can't because, <laughs> again, you're not a protected class. They're a protected yes. class. <laughs> so they can pay off their loan whenever they want, and you, you, can't, you can't stop them from doing that. That's amazing. And you shouldn't, quite frankly. And this was a discussion on Facebook here this week. I saw, uh, no, of course we want to get paid off earlier. Are you kidding me? Yes. <laughs> That, that shoots our returns through the roof. So yeah, we, 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 all my buyers. we had a whole thing fun. about like, how do you determine your return, right? And the faster I get my money back, yeah, the better it is. However, you don't get the interest for that time period. But if I collected interest for three, four, five years, and then I get my money back, I reinvest it. So I'm going to get Absolutely. a quick return and be boom. And if I bought it at a discount, I'm going to get, for those note buyers, right? If you bought it at a discount, you're going to get the entire UPB and be singing to the bank the whole way there so absolutely it's it's almost always that's one of your best exits so yes yes, you want them to repay quickly yeah refinance out whatever however they do it it is golden when they get out so yeah um so yeah so the so again we talked about this you have to disclose your total payment uh, break it down what's principal and interest and what's your taxes and insurance Um, So uh, you do have to escrow on an owner finance loan within the first five years, or at least for five years. Mm -hmm. After five years, if they want to remove the escrow, they can pay that on their own. But it's just really, again, you don't want to set your buyer up for failure. So if you were to separate it in the beginning and they don't pay their taxes, you're going to go foreclose on them because they haven't paid their taxes. So that's not a good thing. So it's better to just say, hey, this is what the total monthly payment is going to be. And you need to be able to afford the total monthly payment every yeah. month. Yeah. Um, so on the loan estimate, we also give them um, the, uh, the estimated cash to close so that they know exactly what they're going to be bringing to closing. That's important um, so that they're prepared. And um, um, and they they all, you know, the other thing is just to provide proof that they have the, the funds to close. Awesome. Um, and then the next slide will show kind of a breakdown of what the fees. Um, so the, this is an old, um, this is like an old uh, slide here, but um, we have an estimate of what the closing costs are going to be. We've worked with a ton of, uh, uh, you know, title companies and everything. So we kind of know what, what everything's going to cost. Um, so we just do an estimate of all the fees. Um, the, the, the other thing is that we suggest is to always collect two months of escrow reserves. Um, again, this is just our suggestion. It's not something that you have to do. The other thing too that we re- we recommend is for you to have them pay one year prepaid home insurance. Uh, reason being is if they don't do that and they don't make their payments to the servicing company for two months, that um, that home insurance could lapse and and you you might not have insurance on your your assets or you know what's uh, that your collateral protection right. Right. So um, it, you don't want to be in that position where your buyer's not making their payments and the in, the insurance is not getting paid. Um, so that's a big one. So uh, we recommend that you have them pay it one year in advance. That way, no matter what, they're always going to be covered within that first year and, and so forth and so on forever. And, and all of these things added in here that as a note buyer, that's all warm and fuzzy. And when we see that kind of stuff written in there, oh my goodness. Yes, I'll pay you an extra you know, percentage of, of whatever. Uh, Yeah. As long as I can still hit my numbers, but, but this, this is a very sellable. The only thing I didn't see in here, right. (laughs) And what makes us even more excited, I'm going to say probably the highest, even above interest being high. Yeah. Is the ability. And for note buyers, you're probably going to say, is this legal? And it is including servicing fees inside the notes, meaning The borrower can pay the servicing fees that we typically net out when we make an offer, that if the servicing fee is 20 or 35, I know Kevin's listening, right? And so how? We literally can set this up where we're buying notes and those originating, if you can include this, great, that the borrower pays outside of their P&I, P-I-T-I, the uh, the price of the monthly servicing and make sure you include it, it'll adjust. So that is even more fuzzy, right, Nathan, that if oh, yeah. they can pay servicing fees of twenty, thirty-five dollars a month, whatever the fee is, it's golden. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Like you say, we're always netting that out. So if that can be included in there, oh my goodness. Yeah. So instead of collecting three thirty, well, yeah, so, uh, we're collecting three fifty. Yeah. 
Right. So yeah, we always encourage every single person that comes to us, we are always going to encourage to hire your loan servicing company to make sure that they're doing all of the, the reporting on your behalf, making sure that they're collecting those, those payments and paying all the taxes at the end of the year. It's such a headache, um, you know, just with my own personal portfolio. Yeah. I mean, servicing is a lot. So if somebody can do it for $35 a month, please be my guest. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I'll, absolutely. also make sure they're licensed. Okay. Don't get a, a loan service yes. company that's not licensed. So <laughs> licensing is a big thing. And MLS, so the fact that what states services are licensed, I know Kevin and like, so, so how are on right now uh, on the broadcast. Um, so, and also on LinkedIn, you can definitely talk about this stuff, but the idea that when a servicer is licensed in certain states, they can collect on your behalf. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Um, Kevin made the comment that as long as it's on the contract and they agree to pay the fees, we're good to go on that. Yeah. So include it in there because, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. oh. That's, that's a fantastic. And we, we do on the, we, we always do on the loan disclosures also, just right off the bat, just we just add it on there for every loan disclosure that we send out, regardless if you're going to use a servicing company or not, uh, just because, you know, we want to be sure, right? Hey, you know, this is where you sh how you should go. This is the path you should take. Yeah. <laughs> so we got we had a ton of questions on this, which is great. Um, there's been a lot of questions on this, both for the note buyers and for the note creators. Uh, let's go back to this one. Um, Allie, she's asking if she has a property that she wants to do owner financing on, and then she gets two or three different applicants. They all look relatively good. Does she run all, let's say there's three applicants, does she run all three of them through an RMLO just for the underwriting part of it to see which one best qualifies? So we don't, we don't do, pre, we don't do pre-qualifications without a contract um, because of this reason, right? I mean, if somebody is doing all this marketing and you're getting all these, these people contacting you to buy this house and they're just sending them over to us, we're going to be pre-qualifying all day long. Yeah. So, um, I would say you do, you, you, you have to do your best, uh, choose the best candidate. Um, the number one thing that I would look for is, you know, how long they've been at their job. Um, mm -hmm. you know, maybe if you've got three applicants, but one of them has been at their job for 10 years. Um, I think that that's, you know, a big one. Um, if, um, you know, someone's putting a large down payment or somebody's giving a better large, uh, dark pay, I'm sorry, uh, down payment better than another person, um, that's, you know, skin in the game. Yeah. Um, so they're not going to, you know, want to foreclose or risk foreclosure. Um, so I would definitely go with that person. But um, yeah, I think that the, 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 the owner, the seller um, needs to make that decision first before they send them over to the RMLO. Okay. Um, and you can request, you know, um, say, hey, you know, send me one pay stub or, or one bank statement, just something that you can kind of just look and see, okay, yeah, or, or, um, or just ask the questions, how long have you been at your job? What do you do? You know, yeah. just a quick, quick interview. Okay, awesome. awesome. As a reminder to everybody, we're, we're going to go through some more of these questions. As a reminder, Sarah is going to be at DME. Yes. Uh, so you can pester her with all kinds of questions in person. <laughs> She can't get away. <laughs> I'll put the uh, referral code. I think it's mine, whatever, in the yeah. DMV, uh, to, in the Facebook comments, as well as LinkedIn. So yeah, use Dave's. Uh, so it's real quick fun. aside, use yeah. Dave's because it gives us the tracking. We know yeah. uh, which which referrals are working best. So we can know if Dave is the best referrer. Then <laughs> I'm trying, a, guys. Help me out. A high five or something. I get a, I get a free like microwave or something, right? The, yeah. The other thing is just, just for people's information, yeah. the reason I'm pushing the, the uh, early bird tickets so much is I need to know how much food to order. I need oh. to know how many water <laughs> bottles to order. I need to know how many lanyards to order. The so that's, for me, that's my purpose for you is to save a couple hundred bucks. For me, it's all about planning and it's, it's hundred yeah. percent about planning. If you want to spend more money, that's fine. But then that yeah. just gives me a better head, bigger head. And today's the last day for so the, the last day. So make sure you get on top of that. So help me. Plan. Like, we have a ton of questions. I'm trying to keep them organized. So follow, follow if I'm distracted here once in a while. Um, let's let's try wrapping some of these questions in and yeah. basically be like shooting Freaking arrows at the side. We feel bad. Yeah. I apologize. Go ahead. Nathan, which one do you jump off the page for you? Let's go. Uh, Ali, just real quick, she also asked about how soon can I sell a note after it's originated? 
It depends. If you're talking to me, I'll buy it right away. If you're talking to Dave, if it's been through an RMLO, yes. I'll buy it immediately. Dave wants a little bit of seasoning on his. Which three, is six fine. months. Yep. Is, is, we'll buy a table, but we're going to give you a huge discount on your on the note itself on uh, because of just the risk level. Yeah. Well, that's good um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a really quick suggestion there. Um, if you actually establish a relationship with your note buyer, um, you could probably have no seasoning on your notes um, with maybe like a buy back clause, you know, yeah. um, that says, hey, if this doesn't perform within the next three to six months or something happens, I'll buy it back from you. And Excellent. it's just kind of that, you know, you establishing that relationship and that that they that note buyer knows that you're going to be sending them good good paper and. And so just as a suggestion. Yeah. And if the borrower has been a tenant for a year, that's still seasoning. That tells me the fact they've been able to repay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Good question. Cool. If it defaults, Ali, then yes, you got to go through a foreclosure. That's just how the process goes. Yep. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Good job, Sohal. <laughs> Sohal made the comment that he used Nathan's referral. Good job. There you go. Good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Just reading through the questions here. Yeah. Make sure nothing on. Seneca, I sold a piece of land which the buyer has placed on mobile home on. Now, what can I do in retrospect to protect myself? Yeah. Uh, so if they if they're living on that uh, mobile home. Yeah. Then, um, you know, it, it it would be a good thing to just reoriginate it. Yeah. We had a question from the note pusher on LinkedIn that can you modify. Can you do that modification with only land contracts or existing notes too? Anything you've originated can be uh, newly Justin. originated. You can't yeah. modify it if the terms are that not done correctly. So you have to create a whole new process, a whole new note, because that original note can't be modified. From my knowledge, we'll ask Jeff on the next call. You have to create a brand new note and make sure it's legit and underwritten and rmlo would for that state. Now, that being said... Yes, uh, just if you're going to a note buyer, most note buyers, most private note buyers will look at whatever pay history that you had and count that towards the history of the note. Most of the time, you'll get some banks or, or somebody that they won't qualify that most private buyers, they'll look at whatever pay history you had beforehand and they'll say, yeah, that counts. Just FYI. Awesome. So you haven't lost anything. So... Um, I'm just grabbing some Mark. questions for Nathan. Yeah, Mark. Joe here. We have Mark's asking about what about the self-employed people that may not keep the best records of their income. So uh, we always work with obviously, uh, you know, ninety percent of our our um, end buyers are going to be self-employed or paid cash. So we're yeah. very used to working with that clientele. Um, so we help them in any way, shape, or form to come up with that proof of income. Um, so for instance, you have your landscaper, um, that, you know, um, has maybe five houses and one commercial property that he, um, that he gets money from and they pay him cash. Um, so we would, um, kind of help him out by saying, okay, let's go get a 1099 from each one of your employers. Let's do a verification, uh, actual written verification of employment from each employer. Um, and, um, you know, just start getting, um, you know, building, um, I guess, building that proof of income with, with additional documentation. Um, so that's something that we're used to. Um, so that's something that will work directly with the buyer to obtain. Um, again, we're very used to doing that. We have that all the time. Um, now, the only people we cannot help, <laughs> the only people we cannot help is somebody who says, I'm flat out, I, I don't, I'm not employed. I don't have a job. <laughs> and trust me, I've had those. <laughs> I'm not employed. Wow. Okay, well, those are the only people we cannot help. <laughs> <laughs> unemployed, but somehow they're receiving mysterious income. <laughs> you probably want to run away anyway, so that's fine. So uh, we, the next ahead. question I see here that stood out for me um, was from Nick. Good question. Where are Nick? Good question. Does how does the usury law affect APOR? Are you familiar with that? How does it? Is there effect? If do you know how that affects it? So um, the the usury, I think that goes way above above the thre the thresholds that we're looking at staying under. Um, this is why we're here and and having this talk today is so you don't get to that point, right? 
Um, so if you're going to go rogue and you're not going to use an armillo and you're just going to go and charge the buyer whatever interest rate you want, then you definitely need to just go research that in your own state, in your own state and see what that that max usury rate. I think it's like 24% or something. So if if you're going to be a predatory lender, then <laughs> yeah, go check those those thresholds out. But if we're we're what we're talking about today is not to be that, not to go over those thresholds. Um, so th again, the higher price right now is going to be the six and a half plus prime. So that puts you around 12, 13 percent. Um, if you're going to go high cost, you're probably going to be around 15 percent, 14 to 15 percent. And uh, no buyers, 13 percent loan. We like we like those higher interest rates for us. No buyers, sure. we want that bigger return. Yeah, um, for right. sure. But you so, can, yeah, I mean, that's still good at 12%. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're used yeah. to buying it at 6 and 7%, so a totally different market here. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so that's not bad at all. So let's go through some of the so, questions here. So um, Hill's got a good one about uh, yeah. credit. When you're looking at, like, if you're trying to determine somebody's debt to income, let's say you look at that credit report and then you see that there's, like, child support payments on there. How does that affect their, their debt to income ratio? For sure, we'll add it to their to their liabilities, okay. and we'll um, you know obviously we'll get current proof of what they're paying today. Um, yeah, but yeah, that's definitely something that we'll add to their liabilities. Yeah, good question, um, Edgar. The question was regarding a situation where the market value of the property is one fifty. They ask one sixty with ten percent down. Would that be compliant with situation um, regarding the fact that they basically sold it for more than the market value says it is? That's a very common thing with seller finance. Um, there's no wrong or right way to do that thing. It's more about the borrower um, and making sure they have the ability to repay. So they basically would, you're saying is you would sell for 160, they put 10% down and then they're, you finance a rest. I hope that that correct on your question there. Um, yes, and I mean, the, there, there is no, uh, I mean, that's the whole benefit of doing owner finance, right, is that you can mark up your property as much as you want yep, um, sure. versus going retail and having to get, you know, uh, a lot, a lot of these notes don't, that they don't have an appraisal. So even if they did, okay, so one of my personal properties, I'll get an appraisal, it'll say, hey, your properties, this is the appraised value. But as an owner finance uh, seller, I'm going to sell this property as, at XYZ. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my prerogative to do that. And if you want the house with owner finance, you're going to pay the higher premium. Right. And typically I tell everybody stay under 10%, right? 10% <laughs> is probably 10 to 15% is probably average. It's probably good, but anything over that, then yeah. <laughs> so, and, and maybe a clarification for those that are doing seller finance, be, the fact that you are offering financing means that you don't have to compete with the bank on a rate. I was, I was talking to somebody in Utah a couple of weeks ago and, and he was showing me that he's got this property that he wants to sell on terms and he was offering 5%. I'm going, why? Why, why are <laughs> why? you trying to undercut the bank? Like you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, there's no reason to offer that at a cheaper rate. They're coming to you because they can't qualify for the bank, which means yep. you can charge a premium. So go ahead and ask for that 10% because yeah. that's the way they can. Especially own. if you're especially if you're thinking of selling that note, um, the number one thing, uh, recommendation that I'm gonna give you guys or advice is you, ha I would, you would have to have or have a conversation with your note buyer. Ask him what he wants, right? You know, what DTI are you looking for? What uh, LTV are you looking for? Um, and, and, you know, the interest rate is a big one. I had someone call me too and they said, oh, well, I'm going to write this note at 8%. Do you have any note buyers? I said, mm, nope, I don't. <laughs> I mean, no, you, you can't, if you're going to do this as a business, you're going to want to sell that note at the end of the day. It has to be attractive to your note buyers. Absolutely. So talk yeah, to your note buyer first before you go create that note. I'll put the blog in the comment section of what makes a note valuable, right? It's all about the term, the lower the term, the quicker payback, the higher all the interest rates, right? Um, balloons okay and all that stuff. It's a matter of how fast I can get my money back and how much money am I get on the money. So those two pieces are principal thing. Forget the UPP. I know we've talked about this immensely, that, and I'll talk about the DME, that get over this idea of percentage of UPB because mm -hmm. it doesn't take into account the fact that the interest rate, the term, everything there is missing. So hopefully we drive it home some more at DME, but the interest rates, the UPB is only one part of it. It really is not a big part. It's the interest rate as well as the term. It's a mathematical financial calculation um, to go through that. So yeah. 
Um, I see Ray asked a bunch of good questions too regarding um, is a higher price code for predatory or what is the current threshold to stay under to stay away from being a predatory lender? I presume it's everything we talked about today, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so it's, um, you don't want to go into the high cost. So high cost is where you don't want to be. That's the threshold. You can, you still can. Like I said, the buyer just has to go through a little bit of more uh, loops. But um, so again, six and a half plus prime. That's your max interest rate to stay under that threshold. And you can go bankrate.com and go look up what the prime period is for the week. Um, I think it uh, adjusts every Tuesday. So you can go there. Check it out. Do your, uh, you know, just add your six and a half. That's on a first lien mortgage, by the way. So um, if you are going to be writing a wrap note or a sub two, and it's going to be considered a second lien, then you can go eight and a half plus prime. Gotcha. That's great. And then, and I can see Mark's wheels turning on this other question <laughs> where he says, <laughs> if you're going to do an arm, where we talked about like an, instead of a balloon, you do an adjustable rate, and after five years, you increase it. He's asking, is there a cap on that? And how do you determine yeah. how much you can increase it? Right. Um, so um, that's a tough one <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I'm going to say, you know, I, so we're always going to have a floor. So if you're going to write an arm. We're going to have your floor. You're going to start at 10%. Let's just say um, your floor, it'll never go under 10%, no matter what. Yeah. Um, and then, so you say after five years, we're going to go two points above the APR plus prime. Sure. So, so then, you know, that's how you're going to, how you're going to write this promissory note to say, Hey, after five years, whatever the interest rate is of that, that in that moment, it's going to be six and a half plus two points on top of that. So that's a bit of a gamble. So remember, an interest rates drop then. I mean, remember these thresholds and everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, if you have a specific question to Sarah, in the chat box, you, you, there's a link for, uh, should be pinned for a webinar thing. Just fill it out and you'll get Sarah's direct information and she'll get yours as well. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It's um, really good. Very interesting. So, so Hal asked uh, or made a comment that on arms, I would have a cap of 2% per adjustment. That's well said. So, Hal, appreciate that. Okay. Okay. So, very so this good, is very really, good. Again, this is being recorded. This will be on YouTube, our podcasts, all that good stuff. Um, so feel free to jump in there. You'll get it. If you fill out the webinar, you'll get to get a bunch of emails just to let you know more about it. And we're going to have a legal attorney on in two weeks, uh, Jeff Watson, to explain what happened if you did it wrong. How can you correct that part of it? And all the kind of intricacies. And Jeff's been around for 32 years, and he told us. So he's been around for a long time. So for sure. And he's one of the top guys to talk about yeah. selling financing. He's going to Washington. He's doing all these yeah. things. He's he's a fantastic okay. guy to ask these questions too. So Ali asked a really nice question. All right. Uh question for us, Nathan. Do yeah. we pay less percent of UPB when the bar has an I-10 instead of an SSN? Ooh, Does that matter to us? That's a good one. <laughs> Uh, that's a. I've never thought about that before. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't think that would. Can affect I say something? Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah. <laughs> Can I say something? I have. A, I have a note buyer or lender that only <laughs> that, that likes only I ten. <laughs> okay. And why is that? What's the advantage? Or what's that perceived in, advantage? Uh, <laughs> in our experience here in Texas, uh, we have a one percent default rate uh -huh. on on. I ten borrowers. Okay, that that was my question, and then my the, the other place my brain goes is like, if if there is a default, can I still foreclose with no issues? And I, I believe the answer is going to be yes because I'm foreclosing for the title. Yeah, I don't think that would make a difference. That's a good question for Jeff. Bring that question back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come back in I two like weeks. Let's, let's Ali, if you can join us up. in two weeks and twenty six, well, we have Jeff on for that's a great question for us per se. What we care about. We've again, we bought bank originating notes, so this kind yeah. of goes out the window. But I would say that as long as they're underwritten and they have the ability to repay, and our focus as note buyers is can if things go bad, can I foreclose and get that property back and sell it and give them money out of it? Exactly. That's yeah. all we care about. So, yeah. as long as the legal process can secure that, and I'm sure you know Kevin could jump in here too. As long as that is not affected, I don't care what it is. No. 
right? As long as I, I'm going for my I return mean, yeah. and my foreclosure. Yeah. And that's 90, I mean, for us, it's 90% of our business because, um, you know, here in Texas, you're, you're, I mean, that's the majority of, of our clientele that can't, the people who are going to go to owner finance is because they can't go to a traditional bank, right? Mm -hmm. So they have an, a social security number and they can go get a loan through a, a traditional mortgage. Um, they're not going to go this route. So the people that are, the people that will never be able to get financing through a bank. Right. Just to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. hmm. Interesting. Good question. All right, Sarah, I think we're kind of coming to a close. Dave, are there more questions? Are we good? No, I don't think so. Um, if anyone has a final question before we let you guys go, please put it in the chat before we let Sarah go. I'll, once again, I don't see the pin thing in there, so I'll put the repin in there. Click that link, fill out the information, and you'll get an email right from us, um, response back to from me. Uh, we encourage you to, to go get the DME signed up. Uh, if you have notes for sale, you can reach out to both of us. You can send me an email and I'll share with Nathan. Uh, we are yeah. separate companies, but we cooperate together. So we love to talk about this stuff and make sure you guys are doing things right so we can make a bunch of money ourselves. So we're a little selfish in that world, but I guarantee you as many loans you can sell us, we'll give you the money and you can repeat this process and go create as many notes you want to so we can buy them from you. So that relationship can work out. Um, there are a lot of us out there, are note buyers, who do yeah. this specifically work. So we encourage you to kind of stay, stay involved, stay active, and join us in, on the 26th. Uh, you'll see a post shortly uh, about that, and we'll go from there. If yeah. there's any other questions, I appreciate everyone's giving thank yous, and uh, Ray say thank you, and Kevin, all that stuff. Everyone's saying thank and you. And happy Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Yes. Happy Cinco de Mayo to all my Texas folk. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, Melissa, she could spend another eight hours on this topic. Well, the legal process would be great. Feel free to to join with us, shoot an email to us. If there's a topic you want us to cover on that world, let us know and we'll definitely focus on it. We want to help you guys create the best note possible so that we can help, we can make our money as well. So we're a little selfish, like I said, um, but first and foremost, we want to thank Sarah so much for spending yeah. a, uh, an hour and a half with us on this Friday afternoon uh, from Texas. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing her in person at DME in Nashville uh, on June 2nd. Um, just another reminder, the hotels expire today. So, uh, and your tickets go up in price. So awesome. Uh, if you have any other questions, let us know. The link's there and we'll go from there. Sarah, if you could hold on for a minute, we're disconnect from the uh, public and uh, wrap it all up. Thank you, everybody. Have a That's great awesome. weekend. Thank you very much, Sarah.